We are in the book of Revelations still. Revelation chapter 3 is where we're at today. One of the shorter letters, but one of the more positive letters. If you were going to rename uh, a Dr. Seuss book uh, named after the, the church at Philadelphia, maybe it would be the little church that could. Um, although I know that's not a Dr. Seuss book, but um, really he doesn't have anything against the church um, here. We, you know, each church has had a condemnation or uh, um, we've, we've, had, uh, we've had Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis. They've all, most of them have had commendations, some not. Most of them have had condemnations, some have not. Um, all of them have an assignment and a reward that goes along with it. And so um, today, Philadelphia is, is, uh, is kind of a unique one because Philadelphia is mostly, uh, it's almost like he's talking to a remnant. There are a lot of people, if they've, if they've typed some theological um, importance to uh, the, the seven churches and the seven church ages, they would say that we definitely are in the Philadelphia age. The Philadelphia age is one where they get promised that they're going to be taken out uh, uh, they're going to be taken through or by or out of uh, the tribulation, and we're going to talk about that when we get there. Um, uh, Philadelphia is a fertile valley. valley. It's, it's, the doorway, um, it's the doorway to the world um, that was known at that time. And uh, it was also a place, it was famous for its Olympic games. Not Olympic, but Olympic-type games. And now, remember, what, what were given out at the end of the games? Well, they were given, instead of we're now in the Olympics, we get, we get gold medals or bronze or whatever. But then what did they get? They got that laurel wreath that was placed on their head. It was a crown that showed that you had won the race. Okay? So anytime that we see the word crown in the Scripture, sometimes we think the gold crown, or we, you know, we may think the crown of thorns, but... But a lot of times, it's, it's from, the, it's from the, the current day society where when you run the good race and you finish and you win, you get the crown that represents you're a winner. Now, let me go ahead and, and simplify this. If you're with Christ, you're a winner, okay? That's good news. Uh, no matter what, we're, we're, uh, we're already winners because of that. So we're going we're gonna to look at uh, Revelations chapter 3 and... Um, let me find it here. I don't want to do what I did last week. Just read the whole thing, and then we'll go back and we'll kind of uh, dissect it a little bit. So this starts in verse 7. So if you'll read along with me in your Bible, and then we'll go to the screen after this. Uh, Revelations 3, chapter 3, verse 7 and following. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David... Who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put them before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews but are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and make them know that I love I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown." He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of the heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, and that's really important. Because no matter how you look at it, when, when John is writing down what Jesus is speaking to be given to the shepherds, the, the, the messengers of each of these churches, it is for them specifically, and it's for anyone who has an ear, let him hear. So it is for us. And everything that he says to every church from a positive perspective is applicable to every other church. Okay, so in other words, some people might say, well, 
uh, the church, uh, this church is the only church that might be somehow uh, saved from uh, from the tribulation. If if you're a pre-tribber like I am, if you're a post-tribber, then then you believe that that he means he's going to save him through this. Despite this, you're going to have a special hand of protection over you. But at any rate, this isn't just about the church at Philadelphia. This this is about every one of those churches. Every because I believe that every one of these churches is active and alive today, and every type of person that we see in these churches is in every type of church that we have today. So, so we'll get into that. So let's go back, verse 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open, says this. Now so far with the other five churches, this is what Jesus, how Jesus has introduced himself. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. It specifically applied something, something to Ephesus. And then to the church at Smyrna, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. Remember, we talked about Smyrna. It, had, it, it, was, it was dealing with some of those issues. The next thing that he says to the church at Pergamos, I am the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Remember, there was some need there for some, some dividing right truth from, from falsehood. Then Thyatira was um, or the one, the son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like his burnished bronze. And it was about judgment. It was about the, the, the fact that Jesus sees everything. There's nothing hidden from him, and he is, he is a holy judge. And then finally, to Sardis last week, he said, "'He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars.'" Every time Jesus gives an introduction, he gives an introduction that connects with that church specifically. It connects with their DNA specifically. Hopefully, when you write, um, when you write a love note to your wife, you may title it a little differently than when you're writing a, just a regular note to your boss. If not, unless your wife is your boss, and I guess it'd be okay. But, uh, you know, one of our favorite scenes out of Courageous is when he, the uh, the police officer just got off the phone with his wife and then he gets off the phone with his police captain and he says love you and he goes oh man I just I just told the police chief I love him I should call him back and tell him you don't love him no just let it go so how you how you title something how you how you go into something it it gives it gives us a little message so just look at this Jesus is saying to these people he who is holy he who is true he who has the key of David, I open and no one shuts. I shut and no one opens. Here's why that was important, because they were, they were, they were persevering. They were struggling in the fact that there were other religious people around who were trying to, to tell them they didn't qualify. You, you're not part of the herd. You, you're not in the Jewish lineage. You're not Israelites. You're not, you're not the purest of the pure. You're just Gentiles. You're just these Christians. Or worse yet, you're a, you're a Jew who has turned and you've become a Christian, so you're, you're doubly disqualified. You don't deserve to be in the temple. You don't deserve to go to the temple. You don't deserve to carry the name of God. You're nothing. We are everything. You're nothing. That is what they're hearing over and over and over again. I think that we can agree that we hear that from our media today. You Christians, you're all lunatics. You're crazy. You're nothing. You have nothing. You just you're 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 feeble, and you just you're just clinging to these old prehistoric notions of a god and all this other stuff because you can't deal with reality. Jesus is saying to you and to me right now, I'm the one who's holy. I'm the one who's true. I am the one who holds the key to the key of David. I open doors. I shut doors. And what we're going to find at the very end of this is he says, not only do you belong in the temple, I'm going to move you into the temple, and you're going to become a permanent fixture in the temple, and I'm going to write my name on you. Now, does that sound like a good thing? Yeah. I mean, we're not going to be cast out because this group of people or this group of people are telling us, oh, you, you know, Jesus is saying to these people, look, if anybody has the right to tell you who can go or come, it's me. And I love you, and I'm welcoming you in. So, um, what is the key of David? And uh, we're going to look at that real quick. Isaiah 22, 20 through 22. Um, now, Gail can tell us firsthand about Dutch sheets, right? Okay, so Rebecca, 
See that lady right there in the white? Um, if you want to talk Wisconsin to her, don't you know? She's the one. This is Rebecca. She's, uh, okay, her great-granddad and my granddad were brothers, which makes her somehow my cousin. She's a student at Belmont uh, Music Business, just declared. Woo! And she needed a little time away from uh, school and roommates and boys. Just to permanently get rid of that. Um, and so she's been staying with uh, Keenan and uh, Sarah and Oaks. So anyways, uh, and she's a Wisconsin person too there. You know, we're all, we're all good with that. Go, go squeaky cheese. So here we are. Isaiah 22, 20 through 22. The reason I bring up Gail is because there was a time when Gail was in Colorado, uh, affiliated with Dutch Sheets Ministry and everything like that. Um, I was telling Sally about this because I was listening to Dutch Sheets teaching on the key of David. And uh, Sally said, yeah, I had that book. And then the girls said, so much horrible stuff was happening in our family. Please get rid of that book. Because that, what, here's, what, here's what Dutch Sheets says. Dutch Sheets believes, um, and, and I don't disagree with him. I just don't understand it enough to, to defend it or, or um, proselytize it. But what he says is that the key of David is basically, it is the key that says, God doesn't just establish authority. God is authority. You see, God just doesn't loan out authority. He is authority. Look up authority in the dictionary. The only thing you should see is God's picture because God has all authority. Now, he may loan it out to this administration. He may loan it out to this king. He may loan it out even to this dictator. He may loan it out to this person or this person or this person. But the authority is always his. Um, Y'all, I've told this story before. I'll bore you with it again. Um, Have you ever seen a Grammy? Anybody here ever seen a Grammy? Okay. On the bottom of a Grammy, it says property of, like the uh, property of the American Academy of Music, blah, 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 cannot be sold. It may, it may be in your house, but it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to somebody else. Um, I think it's interesting that it's an industry that knows eventually you're going to need to sell this so you can le- eat, but they, but they won't let you do that. But, but God, if you look at the bottom of every authority, you're going to find on the bottom of that property of Yahweh, not transferable, <laughs> you know, except I do it, and it comes back to me every time. So here's what, the, here's what he says about the key of David. He says, Dutch Sheet says, the key of David, going back to Isaiah 22, 22, the key of David is a, is a cool story. Let's read it. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Elikim, the son of uh, Hilk, Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely around him. I will entrust him with your authority and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. The ultimate authority of all government rests on the, on the Father. Well, but we've had some pretty horrible governments. Yes, we have. But we are heading towards a time when we're going to have an awesome government. And, and it's not going to be Democrat or Republican. It's not, going to be, it's not going to be anything about that. It's going to be when he comes and he actually takes over and rules things as, as, as he in, intends and, and all that other stuff. But in the meantime, this key of David is a spiritual authority that God has over all authority. Now, as Christians, again... If everything he says to every church in there applies to every Christian who is willing to hear, read, and abide by the book of Revelation and get that blessing, then that means that, that we have that same key of David. It wasn't just the pastor of the church at Philadelphia that was going to get the key of David. It was basically a, I, I have the key, and so because I have the key, you have the key. Um, all the years that I was on staff at First Baptist, and of course I have keys to this building, and, and, uh, but all the years I was on staff at First Baptist, you know, I had keys. Every once in a while, I would loan my keys to somebody. Sometimes I would get them back. Sometimes I would not get them back. God is loaning us. God is giving us this key of David. And so this is, this is pretty exciting. The, uh, what's really interesting is when you look at what was going on in Isaiah, God is always 